So really quick guys, we'll open up this time for questions, so shoot away and who have, whichever person you have questions for, just in general. Don't you pick up a lunch? Uh, Julius, what do you do for shoulder, shoulder uh, health? So for shoulder health for me, typically, um, I do a lot of IYT races, front races. Um, I, don't, I don't typically do a lot of overhead pressing movements uh, when it comes to anywhere from eight to six weeks out from a meet, just to kind of save the shoulders. But for the most part, I know it's, this may sound a little weird. I don't know if this going to help you. But um, so I like to right. use tense units. Yeah. I like to, so anytime I get any kind of strains, those electrodes, you get them off Amazon for like 30 bucks. Anytime you get any kind of strains anywhere on your body, you just place those electrodes in that area and it just attracts. But for the most part, I get worked on uh, by my guy that lives up here, TJ, from um, and a lot of times I can't make it up where I get Tyler to work on me. But for the most part, uh, just uh, making sure that uh, I can either get worked on or I got one of those teams. That's, that's what works best for me. Man, I had this question for you. I was going to ask you this with us anyways. But how has it been, this journey been, doing COVID to now to when you was at uh, in Florida for the hybrid lift? How's the journey been? Uh, so... Going back about two years from uh, two years ago, I got, or a year and a half, um, man, in the beginning, it was uh, it was okay, but once all the mandates started coming out, it was hard to get people to come to the gym. So in that time, I experienced a lot of depression because, heck, when you can't work out and every you don't even know if you're even going to be able to have a chance to lift again the way everything was. Uh, it, it almost to me in my mind because I'm an overthinker. In my mind, I thought that, man, the world's gonna end and I'm not gonna be able to press 800 pounds. This is, the, this is what I was created for. And uh, so, you know, I, I tried to make it to the gym as, much to, as many times as possible. Uh, my gym allowed me to uh, still come. Uh, other than that, I was going to, you know, uh, basically build my own gym. But uh, I would go uh, late at night uh, between, you know, 10 and 12 to go work out uh, because, you know, we didn't want to, cause a big ruckus because everybody in our town, when people want to work out and they, and I don't want to, I don't want other people to look at me and think that, oh, well, he gets to go work out and we can't, you know? So I tried to be as discreet as possible to make sure I got to work out. And it just, the progression uh, come from, from, I say from, from February to that meet in June that was in South Bend, it was initially supposed to be here. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't, the, the frequency of me attending the gym wasn't there, just to be all the way honest. And I think though, uh, though it looked like I had that weight that day, and I probably did, I think it happened for a reason. And two, um, I, was just, I, was, I was being a poor, poor athlete. I wasn't, I was eating, my eating was all over the place. And I'm able to be honest with myself now um, and, and, and just kind of look at it and say, where, where can I change? simply because the great athletes, they find out where their weaknesses are and they fix them. And, if, and, and it doesn't just go with, in the gym either. It's outside of the home, it's outside of the gym. So when you factor in stressors, all, I mean, just all around, whether uh, uh, work, um, the current situation with, uh, with COVID, uh, family, all these things, when you factor in those things, you're not, you're not preparing yourself for, the, for, for performance because a lot of these things affect your, your mind and which is gonna affect your central nervous system. And as well as you know, can you speak on that a little bit about your central nervous system and how stressors can impact? Yeah, I can if you let it. <laughs> but we plan our training around that. We, we, we do maximum extreme workouts every 72 hours and small workouts every 12 or, or um, 24. So we normally do around eight workouts a week, four major workouts like what he would do, you know, and then four small or sometimes six small. And we work on what we need, not what we like. Single mm -hmm. joint stuff, triceps, hamstring, low back. It could be anything like that. That way we don't have muscle imbalances and we don't have injuries. You, you said you got a rough beginning to look at you now, right? Yeah, absolutely. We all snap out of it. How you are in the gym is how you are at home. If you get stressed in the gym, you'll be stressed at home. If you're sloppy in the gym, you're sloppy at home. 
the way it is. You can't accomplish something in the gym, you won't accomplish anything in life either. Well, that's exactly right. So yeah, in that season, right? yeah, yeah I, that's 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 how it was. And and when you're scattered all over the place, and you you call yourself uh, an elite athlete, um, it's almost like uh, you're a hypocrite, right? Because I'm not I'm not being who I say I am, and I'm not doing who I say I was. So the first I think, and he would agree to this, the first thing to being uh, uh, an elite athlete is being able to self self observe, looking at yourself and saying, um, is everything lining up? To where it should be. Am I, am I going to the gym how I should be? Um, am I, you know, following up on the things at work and at home? Because, like he said, that's that's probably that's the truest fact ever. If if you're not uh, in tune in the gym, or, or if, if you're not following up outside of the gym, or vice versa, um, a lot of times, man, that's why you go through these seasons where you're having plateau after plateau after plateau. It's because you're not uh, your thing. Things are not lining up how they should be. So bring the same energy to the gym as you do at home. Vice versa. I got a question. So how do you find that motivation to keep pushing even during even during your trials and tribulations? You talking to me? Both. Both. Uh, well, in, in 73, I had the highest total in the world. I jumped 100 pounds raw in four months because I read a book called Jonathan Livy's The Seagull. And in that back, in that book, the seagull was always getting in trouble for flying too fast. They kicked him out of the flock. And he's on the beach one day. He went 197 miles an hour. He goes, well, what's the limits? You got limits? No, you do not. And he said, what's the limits? And he saw a silver gull at the end of the beach. And all of a sudden, the silver gull was next to him. He goes, how did you do that? And the silver gull said, perfect speed. He said, what is that? He said, perfect speed is being there. Mm-hmm. And I've always believed in the weights are there. I've got them locked out. Weights on my chest, got them locked out. If I get in a fight, you know, which I've been beat up a lot, I'm going to land that I'm gonna land that left hook. We're going to land that uppercut. I don't give it, if I get my ass cooked in my brain, and I always say, why didn't I get to do it? Because in my mind, it should happen. I never doubt it. Never doubt. Never doubt yourself. Don't doubt your training partners. And iron sharpens iron. You know, if you run with a limb, you develop a limp. So if you got a bad training partner, get them the hell out of there. I, 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 I live the life of a, like a samurai. I've done one thing since I was 12 years old. You're looking at it right here. You know, I lived it for years, pretty decent. And then uh, I decided to start writing books. And I've got 12 patents. And I've got, we're all over the world, probably the most famous gym. So that kind of answers your question. When you got people that are rooting for you, that, I'll put it this way. There was a point in time where I, I had so much hate. You can ask my wife, where's she at? My beautiful wife, wherever she's at. I would get so much hate that at one point in time, like I can't tell you how many times I thought about giving up because the hate was so real. And about being uh, a drug addict or about uh, about me being the, the common the common uh, thing that me and TD get is, oh, you're 400 pounds, you should be able to bench twice your body weight. Yeah. Just talking about that. And, and people say that all the time, but like when you go from a point, like I come from the opposite side. I come from a place where I never believed in myself. People very rarely believed in me. So when you have this mindset your whole life of you never being good enough and you never gonna accomplish anything, What's that light that switches? Something has to flip, right? So what motivates me is I remember at one point in time when I was in a jail cell, I had no hope. I had no, I had no drive. I had nothing. I was basically homeless. I remember my wife, I, I, even though, you know, um, at one point I, selling drugs and living that lifestyle, I had a lot of money. But once you get locked up, all that money goes away, right? Lawyer and just paying bills. And, and one of the lowest moments, my wife, whenever I called my wife, she said, I don't even have enough money to get diapers. And it really hit me because it was like, this is the guy that I, that, that I am. This is how it turned out to be. So what keeps me motivated is using those things, those situations, and thinking about those times that I fell on, whenever I did fall on hard times, and that feeling of what it was like just having nothing. No money in your pocket, no drive, nobody believed in you, you burnt every bridge possible. And... Whenever I think about that, a lot of times before I go hit a big lift, you probably see tears coming down my face because it's not the fact that I'm lifting weight every day, day in and out. It's because I'm leaving a legacy behind for my family. I'm leaving a legacy behind for my kids and those in my community that, you know, that don't have any hope, that look up to me every day or people across the world that are like, look, I'm hanging on. I'm hanging on by a thread and, and you're the only thing that keeps me motivated. I'm like, you know, I'm doing this. So that's what keeps me going day in and day out. Like I, I was telling Aaron earlier, it's, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a, I, love, I love to lift weights. I have a strong desire. But I think what keeps me going is inspiring the world. That's what keeps me going is, is, is 
showing people that you can beat the odds, that you can, it doesn't matter if you're on the right side or the wrong side of the track, that you can still excel in life. Heck, I'm 33 years old and still breaking records. You know, I want to be like him. I want to be 70 years old, you know, walking around here, uh, benching weight and, and, and inspiring people. So uh, vice versa, he inspires me and he says I inspire him. So we have to use one another. Like he said, iron sharpens iron. And this is what's so great about the community is we can all come together. Uh, a lot of these people, like how, I, would, I don't know, how in the world would you never would ever expect for us to cross each other's paths besides powerlifting, right? Never, and never ever. So it gives us the opportunity to be able to, um, heck, I remember coming to your gym and he's like, yeah, I heard about you. And I'm like, this guy's a legend. How did he know, how does he know about me? And it's just using those moments, um, it's using those moments to continue to uh, keep that flame lit. I, I remember particularly, I was 12 years old, I, was, I started to train at my first weight set. And I was looking at Iron Man magazines back in, and I said, man, I said, I will, I'm going to be in one of these magazines someday. And the kid that had the magazine said, Simmons, you'll never be in one of these magazines. I'll never forget it. And, I, and that drove me on from that point. And everything's driven, driven me on. And I, I've been lucky, I've accomplished a lot. I, as far as I know, I'm only one of three people to lead five weight class a two-hour win, with or without gear. So all you raw guys and gear guys, it's all the same, don't matter. But then I, I've had 11 United States patents and international patents, and I've wrote 11 books. I barely got out of high school. I'm just like this joker right here. Wow. And I'm, I, you know, but you got to fight every day. And every day I get up, what can I do? How can I help him? How can I help? Now my guys, I got to help them, right? Next weekend, I'm looking for four all-time world records, two out of one guy and two out of a girl. You know, and uh, that's what I live for every day. Then we're going to track me with the blonde over here. I mean, every day it's work, get better every day. Now, you, if you stand still, you're losing, man. That's for sure. Okay, something I want to address while both of you guys are here, because this is quite the opportunity, is I have a lot of younger guys here that are working on their bench press. And you see them bench pressing all the time, but you don't see them doing a whole lot of upper back and lat work. So if you guys could hit that topic first. Well, I'm huge on that. Yeah. Uh, like I was, I was telling him, we try to. Bench press a third, incline a third, and, and a seated bench a third. But we live on upper back four times a week, upper back, four upper back. Week, guys. Yeah, and tries. And uh, tons and tons of tries. Larry Civico told me years ago, your, your bench press is 75% triceps. So I'd bench, I had like about 320 bench, and I'd bench and they'd go backwards. I said, that son of a bitch, you know, he's messing with me. Well, but finally, a me got canceled. I did it for a while, I jumped 20 pounds. I was so far in shape, it would wear me down. So don't worry about it in the beginning, you've got to go up. And then Bill Sino, a guy who won like four or five best chests in Mr. America's, he, he gradually scared the hell out of me. I was 172 pounds with a four, with a, a 340 bench, you know, went 172. Told me a bench illegal, sixes. I did that two years later, I, I, I uh, did 450 at, 100, at 175. Wow. So I used both their methods combined. No one knows everything, Yeah. you know? I think I pulled from, a, from, from there also, so I'm coached under Josh Bryant, and um, we do a style of conjugate, not to the T. It's more spread out, but for the most part, my core lifts, which, yes, people are like, do you train legs? Obviously, um, yes, I do train legs, by the way. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, I, I get to catch a lot of flack, but uh, accessory work for me is, is, is key. So whenever you have, so the way, the way I'm, I'm very uh, basic, so things have to make sense in my head. And the way it made sense for me is whenever you're training your core lifts, whether it's squat, deadlift, or bench, and you think that those lifts are, those lifts are only going to get you so far. Before then, you're, you're going to start having holes exposed in your lifts. What fills those holes? Accessories. So accessories fills the holes and the cracks and the gaps, however you want to put it, to allow the, 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 the piece to be whole. So I, I live off of accessory work. I love the bench, but for the most part, like he said, I'm killing upper back. You see my videos, I, I am a fanatic when it comes to accessory work. That is the only way that, uh, I, that, that I'm, I've been able to progress year after year and stay healthy. You know, um, and it, like he said, you, you have to make sure that you're following up on the small things. And it's just, we make training, a lot of times we'll make training so complicated, but, all it is is identifying a weak point and attacking the weak point. That's all it is. So wherever your weakness is at, you identify it. And that, this is in life in general. This, is, this, goes, this covers all facets of life. You identify the weak point in your training or in your outside life, 
and, and, and you fix it. You work on it. You grow at it. So that's the best way I was able to kind of, for it to make sense in my head, you know? So I don't know if that was helpful or, or not. But. Well, I know if everybody just bench squat and deadlift, like a lot of old people tell you, how come you're not all built the same? We're all built different. And you got to think, does your body have uh, one, one muscle or 640? They all work in unison. So there's two ways to look at it. And like he said, train what's weak. It does no good to do exercises, the wrong exercises. So you want to pick out the right ones. That's, yeah. that's the hard part, right? Yeah. That, that's where it really gets complicated, especially yeah. um, when it gets up to the elite athletes. So when you get, the more advanced you get, you have to be creative on, and that's what I love about West Side of Style Training because they use so, and I just now started using chains for the first time. And they're amazing. You ever use bands? Yeah, I, so, so we, we use bands. But, <laughs> we, we use bands, but uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't see the, the benefit of chains, right, for a long time. And, you know, then you're watching different styles of training. It's like, I, I got, I, I see a weakness, my triceps, because most of you have seen some of my videos where one side I had this imbalance for like two years where I just couldn't figure it out. Well, bands, one, help uh, identify the problem and bands help fix the weakness. But you have to strategically figure out what exercise or variations that are going to be, that are going to help you to be optimal, right? Yeah, yeah, I know, for example, I know my, since my triceps were a weakness, um, I don't think tricep extensions are gonna fix my problem, you know, uh, because ultimately you can only load them up so much. I've used whole stacks of plates. I've, I've wrapped bands around the plates. It just didn't identify the weak, it didn't help fix the problem as whenever I started doing banding, started using bands with benches on the bench. I don't think push downs are worthless. I think they're worthless. Yeah. Because it works the lazy head, it works the lateral head up here. When here's the tricep, it does all the work. That's what we do. Lots of heavy extensions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so for for me, whenever I, I so I would do heavy dumbbell extensions like you're talking about, and because what works for me may not work for you or vice versa, exactly. right? Exactly. So I would get uh, my elbow would flare up because the dumbbells. I, I would have to oh. use crazy heavy dumbbells just to make sure that I'm placing that 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 load on, on, on my muscles, right? So. I found that if I was to incorporate change or do another type of movement like that, but in a different manner, which most likely would be more resistance wise as far as like bands or something like that, um, it, it, I improved and I didn't get that flare up like I was typically getting. So it's just about learning the sport and learning what works for you. Again, we're identifying the weak points and then we're strategically attacking those weak points. If you can handle bands, bands are superior to chain because it overspeed eccentrics. It causes greater kinetic energy into the body for reversal strength. Now, if anyone familiar with depth jumps, that's why we do depth jumps. You know, if you do too high, if it's too heavy, you do too high depth jump, you become stronger, but you don't jump any higher because the automation phase or the, or the absorption phase, you're too long into the ground before you jump. You know, it's a different thing, but it's the same thing. That's yeah. why bands, you know, for that, it's superior. Faster down, faster up. If you know one, please, but take a ball, drop a ball, how high does it bounce? Go down, it bounces that high. Same thing. Your body works just like those rubber bands, ligaments and tendons stretch and contract. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest improvement that I've seen um, over the past six months is because I've used, we've incorporated bands into, into programming. Too, so, go ahead. Well, you're right. Too much band can kill even you, I guess. Oh, yeah. You've got to be careful. Well, I mean, because... Uh, on the on the descend and um, on the eccentric and concentric, <laughs> you have to control the weight, so you're fighting it the whole time. When, when chains, a lot of times, uh, whenever you're coming down before you press, uh, a lot of times you're not fighting as much as you are fighting uh, fighting it whenever the load is using using resistance bands. So you're just master weight. It's tough. Yeah. When when you're at what I'm usually, what'd you say? If I'm at 80 percent, was it 650? 640. 640. So 640 uh, using bands, even if, if I'm using, you, typically it's we, we would go 70 or 75 percent and add some bands, and it feels literally it feels like it's the heaviest weight I've ever had because I'm having to fight that resistance up and down. I want to mention one thing, maybe of course, but a lot of string coaches I talk to, I have a hundred of them come there. Strength's not measured in weights, it's not heavier or light, it's measured in velocities. When you understand the weights are in velocities, explosive strength is 30, 40% fast velocity, speed strength or acceleration, 75 to 85%. That's what weightlifting is. Weightlifting is a speed strength stored. A power clean is not gonna make explosive, just let's use 30 or 40%. All right, and then slow strength, 
or you know, or maximum strength is a heavy waist where the barbell moves down probably about 0.5 meters per second. So you, if you're trying to build a certain kind of strength using the wrong weights, you're going to fail. Like explosive strength and, and the plyometrics go hand in hand, you know. So like, like I was telling him, we do 25 squats or deadlifts at, at um, you know, 75, 80, or 85 percent, and followed by 25 deadlifts. High volume, 50 lifts, you know, and it takes us about 40 minutes. We, we work up that weight and we hit it. And uh, that's comprised of 33% band tension plus weight. Okay, so, you know, you got that. So how do you know what, what weight to use when you're trying to equate band tension and weight? You at, if you took 80%, and I, <laughs> let's see, let's see. 500 pounds, I'd take a third of it would be band tension and the rest would be weight. Okay. Okay. Sense. And see the reason I uh, tell you about velocity. If you come to my gym, you got thousand pound squatters over here, you got six hundred pound squatter over here. If you're training eighty percent, the barbells move the same speed. That's very very important. That way we that's why we don't overtrain. Yeah. You know, you come into a gym, he'd be a bad example. I mean, really honestly, but everybody try to keep up with him, and he would kill the entire gym. I've seen it a hundred <laughs> times. Like you got that one strong guy, and everybody else is just dead because yeah. they try to keep up. Every, you know, it's like you got to have the right size fish for the right size bait. That's what it amounts to. I appreciate the compliment because everybody. Yeah. Well, that is. Uh, do you have you seen it? Yeah, everybody. Look, everybody on YouTube will, will make fun of me, and they're like, "Oh, he he he's so fat he can't walk to the walk to the fridge." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what I hear all the time, and it's like, man, if he was in the gym with me, I'd work I'd work circles around you. You know, that's what. So I got I got this comment from Eddie Hall. He was like. I can't believe he's like, we're not done yet. I'm like, we're just getting started. <laughs> and he's like, wow, you train like this every time. I'm like, every day when I go to the gym, this is how we, this is, that's why you see like, even before I even benched, which uh, it changed a little bit, but even before I benched, I'm already probably getting in 300, I mean, th three to 5,000 pounds of volume already, even before I even go into my uh, bench session. So, And it would kill normal people, but you do, see? Yeah. GPP, General Physical Preparedness. They don't believe in it, but they can't recover. I, I absolutely, if you saw how many people come to my gym, strong guys, halfway through the squat workout, they're over there laying on the floor. I'm going, what the hell? I mean, not only have you got the squat, we got to do 25 deadlifts. And you can't even get through the squats. I mean, literally, the lane bowed over there. Just, I've seen it over and over and over. Any other questions? Yeah, I got some. Go ahead. Um, well, most of the time you guys talk about so it's like the young guys, but I'm 50, my, and I want to keep training. But if I follow the same volume, like I saw about triceps, my, my elbows will start hurting. You know, I work 60 hours a week. I work almost every Saturday, 10-hour minimums, usually 12s. So when I get to my garage at night, you know, I'm usually already beat up and tired. And it seems like when I try to get that kind of volume, I'll start to get all the aches and pains. And, and so what do you guys do to mitigate that back? Is there anything you can take for your joints? Ultra high reps. Yeah. At 52 years old, I had the second biggest squat in the world, only behind Eddie Cohen. All right, 52. I had the six best bench at 54, 10 best deadlift at 57. Why? Because I was in shape. You ever watch Wild Kingdom? Watch Wild Kingdom with a bunch of old buffaloes. The old buffaloes, when it gets cut out in the back of the herd, gets killed. And that's what you're doing. You're just letting yourself get cut out and get killed. You high rep, you'll, if your elbows hurt, you'll high repetitions because your elbows need ligament and tendon work. Once you build them up, then your pain will be away four or hammer curls. Hammer curls and grip work. I don't know what you do for a living. Like I've worked hard for years. I don't do crap now. But uh, the more the more I did, I never had any problems like that. But it takes high reps. I was telling a gentleman in here somewhere, tore a peck, and how he's got to do you know 50, 70 reps uh, per set, like two, three hundred a day, soft tissue work. Your ligaments, tendons don't have blood in them. If you tear a tendon, they don't bleed. Tear a peck, you get black or blue. Tear a tendon, it doesn't bleed. Why? No blood supply. What's that tell you? To build ligament tendon strength, you got to do high reps. And all that stuff before I work out. So I, should I still should I do that to warm up and then still do that after I bench? I, I watch you. What the hell you did about every piece of equipment in here? Warm it up. <laughs> I mean, I'm going like, dude, that's old school. Yeah. 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 So what's, everybody says um, after an hour you're not supposed to work out anymore because your testosterone falls off. Well, so you know, that that's bullshit? 45 minutes, but it goes slow. Then once you take away every five six minutes to replenish yourself, yeah. well, one of them can't be right because we train fast. But we're in shape. Right. Like if, you know, if he, these guys in my gym, we had to start doing rack pulls. One of them is going to fall out. 
It, you know, so there's five, then there's four, there's three, oh, yeah, two, then one. So as you start falling down, we go, we actually go faster, not right. slow. I'm a high rep guy. Keep up. So I mean, oh, contrary, contrary to normal beliefs, <laughs> yeah, they they used to say like doing high reps at light weight, like you can't. It has no uh, benefit for adding on muscle, but research nowadays says that it does. So bodybuilding. Yeah, but that's exactly right. So um, that's what I've been incorporating. And I don't. I quit focusing on how heavy the weight is, um, and I might raise the intensity just a little bit. But I'm focusing on multiple sets, multiple reps. It all depends how. Yeah, like the 50. It all depends how I feel that day. If I'm, if I'm, and, and with with to an extent because I don't want to overtrain, but I've trained my body to a, an extent where I'm used to it. It's like. Con condition my body. It's just like a bricklayer. You know what I mean? Like they are just solid. Have you ever seen a bricklayer that's th uh, 90 pounds and and and, and <laughs> with no muscle? It, it it takes time over time just building up. I mean, good over you know 50, 60 year olds. I've seen bricklayers and they're still seem what, what like they're in the same condition as they was in their in their 30s because their body is conditioned to do this year after year after year. So I just think for for me, uh, that's something that I've implemented and just watching uh, him, like stuff like Westside and, and Matt Winning and, and along with Joe House Strong and just kind of coming up with my own mixture and going off. The, the, I think the biggest asset you can have is listening to your body. You have to listen to your body and know when's enough is enough. So I, I, that could be wrong. Some people don't believe in that, but I believe in if because a lot of times I found myself where I didn't listen to my body and I overtrained so much, uh, my CNS was so taxed. Heck, I was out for a, a week. I just couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to go to the gym. So. Do you train here? No, I train my garage. Oh, that, they got a band bar. It would come out of my gym. That band bar is the key, dude. I have a thick shoulder. And in three months, I've been 300. People still in the sling in three months. But I had the Cleveland Brown surgeon do him when it first called a hemi socket, and he truly wanted me to rip it out of there if I could. I mean, he didn't say it, but he, he knew I'd be the yeah. candidate. If anybody could screw it up, it'd be me. Well, I never did. That's 2005. I've been body slammed and everything else is still in there. We use it on, always on the main days, and then come back and do more of a lot of them. Uh, the Bam Bell Bar? High reps, high reps. Yeah, I've seen you yeah. use that thing. Yep, yep. Yeah, but that Bam Bar, you used, mm -hmm. listen, I told a guy in here, close grip, move your grips in and out, take it down your belly and up through your throat. So you're in every possible angle. High reps, set, like no less than 20 reps a set. If you, for you. We, we would never do less than 10 reps. I mean, even for max strength. That's what we did. Yeah, I mean, well, you think about it, even, even, uh, so this last training block over the past 10 weeks, heck, uh, I, the way Josh programmed my programming was uh, we started out with like 475, which 475 for me is like 60%, something like that, working all the way up to, I mean, doing multiple reps. I think one, in one training session, I did 500 for 50 reps total, 500 pounds. Yeah, and, and it just kept, I kept getting stronger and stronger. That's why uh, this, this 782, this last two weeks ago, that's why I flew so much, just because I built such a solid base. So you're not, you're going to max up the work in, then buying work another day, or you don't feel good like that? How do you say you're so, so I don't do my programming, Josh does, but it's, mine is spread out over a long period of time. So the max effort for them is every week, correct? Every Wednesday in the bench and every Saturday for speed. So mine is usually every two, two to three weeks. Yep, yep. So it's just spread out over a long period of time. Strength is more important than speed. All right, it's the most more important than strength. And then we actually would do, we'll do uh, six sets of six, and we'll work up for a few weeks. When it gets hard, we draw back and do eight sets of eight. Yeah. And what yeah. you do, ten sets of ten. Yeah. And it really works. That's on speed day. We replace it for speed day with ultra high volume, like what he's doing, with these amount of weight. Yeah. Well, well, because we've tried it where I did this on a weekly basis and we changed things up, but my body wouldn't respond the, w the way other people's bodies respond. I would be so beat up that I couldn't, on my second bench day, I, was, I, would, I just couldn't bench. You know, it wasn't there. So 
we learned that I, for me, benching every every 10 days, every 10 to 12 days, allows my body to kind of get back to its normal state, my central nervous system, and for me to uh, be able to be optimal in bench press. He has a luxury to do that, like Mike McDonald. Anyone know who that was? Okay, Mike McDonald, he'd take a broomstick if he felt sore, he didn't bench, you know. But when you power lift, though, you've got to train on those days, no matter what. Yeah. And I was always my strongest when my triceps are sore and my legs are sore. But I was my strongest. Wow. I mean, it's just, I was always strong like that. Once I did the first set, it was all for running. But I had a great set of training partners, too. Well, so, um, I, I was like, they, they say one way for set. It's like, you know, three guys, I think, are like kind of <coughs> But the, the speed, the weight for speed days on banks and squat, it's been changed. And I read your site where you guys are doing five, six, five. So for, for a raw guy, are you guys doing 65%, 75%, 55%? Well, let's see, I had uh, Eric. Eric's a 600 raw bench, and he used 475 for sets. So how much? I don't know what that is. You got to figure it out. 78. 480. Yeah, there you go. So he was right there. Calculated. So you're just 21 years old. <laughs> we, here's why we went to fives in the squat. I got a bunch of lazy assholes in my gym. They're doing doubles. It was taking them six minutes to do their set. We used to train every 15 minutes, every minute 15. So I made. I, we did fives. But we broke four all-time world records. Uh, four in the squat. I think, yeah, four, all four in the squat, though. All in the squat. Well, something like, you know, Wayne was saying 35%, 40%, but I did that and got nothing with it. Well, you're not, because that's what, uh, Mr., uh, who was it? Well, that Wayne, uh, he says he's okay, not Matt, he, he was in my gym. Those weights will make you explosive, will not make you strong. So, be like if I hit Julius right now, he'd laugh at me. <laughs> hey, that big, <laughs> hey, that big guy might hurt him a little bit. But I mean, I would have all the speed, but I'd have nothing behind it. But objects and of, light objects at fast velocity produce small force. Just remember that. Heavy objects. Heavy objects is force. Yeah. If well, you, you got stuck in the, if you got stuck in the mud, you want a Ferrari to pull you out or a Mack truck. <laughs> <laughs> that makes I mean, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> Strength, that's where weightlifters in this country screw up. They think speed's the most important or not. Strength, it takes strength. If it wasn't for strength, why they got weight classes? Answer me that one. Why run a 123 lift? What a super heavyweight does it's not speed. That's why we got weight classes. I'm just curious, it looks like you start off pretty quick on your bench. I just kind of wonder what your cues are. What do you think of when you set up for the bench and on your lifts? So, I mean, I don't know. I have a lot going through my head, so uh, that's why. Either you'll see either TD or or Tyler uh, will be spotting. Uh, it just depends at the time. But um, those guys kind of give me the cues what I need to what I need to do to set up because I got so many things. Just like everybody that competes knows, you have to make sure your legs are positioned right. You have to make sure your back is pinched. You have to make sure your hand placement's right because if one if one hand is further out than the other, then the weight's going to be shifting. There's just so many different things that you have to look at uh, when it comes to uh, bench press. <laughs> I mean, for me, and, I, you know, I set up quickly because I'm thinking in my head, it's only a small window. I only get a small window for that maximum, that, that moment where I'm like, okay, it's go time, right? You, you lay down and you, you touch with something on, the, on your back with your, uh, your schedule. So he's what? making sure my shoulders are, are uh, lined up on the bench, and he's making sure my back is tight. Because, as, as we all know, whenever you're setting up for a bench, you don't just go loose back, right? So in order for you to be able to activate the muscles needed necessary for bench press, you want to make sure you retract your lats. They should be pinched. Everything should be tight. You're, you're, they always say it, and Winning always says it also, is you're only as strong as your weakest link. So if there's something that is, that is not engaged when you're bench pressing, then you're going to lose the energy there. That's where the energy is going to stop at. So from your feet being tucked underneath you, using that leverage, from your quads, you already see my quads are already flexed. Even before, even whenever the bar comes off the rack, uh, core tight, back pinched, um, uh, lats kind of locked also. And if, if you don't take that approach, wherever the weakness is, is where you're going to lose the energy. So for me, I've been trying to focus on a straighter bar path, but a lot of times once the low gets heavier, I fade back to my, so the exaggerated J. Right, so I've been trying to do a straighter bar path, but it's it's harder. But I do want a slight, for me, I do want a slight um, shift back up towards my face because I feel like my rear delts are, are engaging more whenever I do that. It's always going to gravitate towards your strengths. That's why it goes back on your shoulders. 
This is my lats are stronger. You're stronger your lats than your arms. You said your arms are behind. Yeah. If your arms are stronger, you go to straight line. So well, I need to focus on my lats more. Or... Lats are more arm. Okay. Yeah, we triceps. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> no, he does it. Keep it up. Julius, Julius is analytical. I'm zen. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I've done this. I did it, and I would just, I would think what I'm doing, go out and just do it. I never thought of nothing. I know, if I couldn't figure out how to do it after all those years, then I ain't no hope. I mean, I made top 10 in the world for 34 years. So it's like you, you watch old fighters, they know how to fight. They, you know, I learned from them too. Don't get too crazy. Fighters relax and win that minute rest. They're not after. I better kill that guy, you know, they're taking it easy. But it, I've, I've practiced, actually, a lot, of, a lot of meditation and Zen for 50 years. And so it just comes, I just go out and lay down and do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm literally part of the, dead is squat, yeah. dead, it don't matter. And, and see, mine's different. I, yeah, I just, I'm an overthink, that's what I do is I overthink. I didn't get my form down until, how long have I known you, TD? Years. About five years. Has it been that long? Is it? That's a dang shame. <laughs> uh, so, I, I, I guess over the past two and a half years, uh, Thomas had helped me with my setup because I'm all over the place. I'm in I'm in Podunk, Kentucky, right? And for the first, even even you know my coach trying to help me, but for the first, you know, three years I've been training with Josh for about six and a half, seven years. For the first three years, three and a half years. I had no idea. You can watch some of my old videos. My feet are coming up. My form was just crappy. Nobody, I, I had nobody to help me set, have a proper setup. There wasn't a lot of guys in my area that knew um, the proper way to set up on a bench press, you know? And yeah, I, I believe now really looking at it and, and after I've been through what I've been through is, I, I know he says I'm analytical, yes, because I have to look at it as a science. I have to use my leverages that are, that are working for me. And I found that the way I set up now is is a lot more beneficial. But before then, uh, before we kind of had a breakdown and look, I had to revisit everything. This was about two and a half years ago. Right after 7.05, I had to revisit and say, like, if I'm gonna get serious and get to this point, we gotta figure something out because I had no leg drive, my feet were shifting, and it was just like being so frustrated because I had no consistency on my lifts. So every season, every season that you're going to go through, um, it's always, there's variables that's going to come in that's going to change. For some reason, our biomechanics change. Uh, mine do all, all the time. I don't know if it's because my, my body's getting, because I'm getting thicker, I'm getting stronger in certain areas, but your biomechanics change. So you have to be able to, again, identify what that is and, 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 and fix it. You know, is that making sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it does to me. Yeah, especially so, the thick part. <laughs> He don't even work out. But uh, so that's, that's what worked for me. And, and even, you know, watch it. So I've had to watch people for time after time after time and take a little bit of information from, from so many different people about how to set up for bench because I'm so big, my back is so wide. And a lot of times my, on, on average benches, my back don't even fit. So I'm unstable, um, my, my body's shifting. So whenever, two years ago, whenever I started implementing more back, like he's talking about, um, my back got bigger. So I was even more shifty and more off balance. So I had to figure out what worked best for me. And that's kind of, I don't even know how I got to this we, question, but. We, we train the same way, but you should never think, change how you think, because that's how you think. Yeah. I've worked with the nuttiest people in the world. You, you know, I'm going to tell you straight up, normal people give you normal results. I don't need any normal people. <laughs> they will only give you normal results. They'll never be super rich. They'll never be super fast or super strong. That's, that's that's the truth. Uh, Leon, uh, I just had trouble understanding on how you do a max effort day every week, how you can do that and not need to deload or anything. That's just, I couldn't figure, I haven't been able to figure it out. Science will tell you if you handle the same way for three weeks in a row at 90% or above, you will go backwards. It's called the law of accommodation. We switch each week. Is it because you, you change the bar and the... Absolutely. And that works, that works uh, on... My gym, I have, I have a, uh, a stack, I have a stack guy. We, we, we track fighters, big men, and smaller men. We break record, the entire gym, at over 92.5% each week, the entire gym, max average. How do you, that's why I've had 150 world records in that gym. So you, you try on the max effort day to hit above 90%? No, max effort. Yeah. That's called a method of heavy efforts. 
<laughs> Listen, if you bench 500 and you triple 490, it means crap to me. If you did 505, you got your new record because it all starts up here in the brain. So max effort is not just a, not depending on a one rep max, it's just max reps or max? Well, for us, it's max single. Okay, max single. But we switch each week. That's how we break a record. So from one week, it might be flat, flat bench. The next week might be incline. It could be floor press. Floor yeah. press. Incline, decline, floor press, you name it. Uh, close grip, wide grip. But so that you know, just plan to win your battles. Don't yeah. plan to lose your battles. So you that ever, keeps on cycling, right? Yeah, if you ever see my shirt, it says, when you go to war, you go to kill, not to get killed. Exactly. <laughs> plan your workouts, plan to win. And you like floor, play, for, for floor presses? Yeah, sure. You don't mind. Listen, you know what? We decide all this at breakfast at 6, we go in the gym at 6.30. <laughs> like, it, okay, I'm, I'm not with these big, whatever the hell these humans are, but let's hear from that hole. And I know they're going to kick my ass on pin three. I know. I know all you. So, so next week, said, Louie, we're going to do pin three. Oh, my God. I got to put up with my brain for all week thinking how they'll kick my ass and lift my suck at. But if you, it's like a bar fight. If you jump on me, you got to fight. Yeah. So we do it in a half an hour. You don't have any anxiety. Yeah. A lot of people suffer from anxiety. They're going to take a match and they can't even come close. Anxiety. And like so, I said, I don't think about crap. I just do it. So you're saying like not last minute, but oh. I mean technically last minute. It's last minute. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna switch up. This is what but, we're doing. Like about. you you guys, you got the big argument, right? I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do well, one of you wins, that's what you do. Yeah. You know, you throw the two out the door, and now you've got to break that record. Well I think that it, finds out that's sports. Every week you got a different opponent across the field from you. And you got to be able to cope with that stuff, see? That's why I learned not to cope with any guys doing it. Can I follow up? Yeah, go for it. Um, you got to show us that, right? Right. So, should, if someone, someone was untrained, would you jump into that kind of trainer, or would you like try to build up like sets of 10 first, or is that okay to? I started boys at 14. They were all-time world record boys at 20. Not teenage, all-time. If you're going to know, if, if a dog's going to bite, he's going to bite as a pup. So you find out right then and there. I never let them live teenage because one day you're not a teenager, you're a man. You go from lifting against boys to men. You better lift against men right now. Mm. Now I was fighting men. I was 14 years old. So I mean, I didn't have to wait until I got older to fight a man. I was fighting him at 14. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm just saying. Not that I'm a tough guy. You were stronger than find out. Grown men. You were stronger than grown men. And the best thing is in fear. Yeah. You got to fear. You go in there, you know, like he said, we're going to pull uh, on a four-inch box. Oh my God. Now I don't want to be a punk. I don't want to punk out in front of these guys. So you put everything you got into. That makes sense. Yeah, and I was saying many, many times, 20 years ago, with Bill Pool, Dave Tate, and all the guys. You'd work out, right? A hell of a workout. You're going to my door. Where are you going, MF? -er? We're having a deadlift contest, or we're having a what? Turn right back around, go ahead and have a contest. And you better do it, or they kick me out of my own gym. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you find out if you want to compete. You'll find out real quick. Do you, are you a competitor or are you not? There's two kinds of prey in this world prey or predator. Find out which one you are, the sooner the better. You talked about being in prison and really not having anything. How soon after that do you realize? that you know, bench press could be your thing and you started chasing that. Where'd you, where'd you start out? Like, what could you do and how much were you weighing that? So let's, uh, I didn't make it to prison. I got two five-year prison sentences, right? So um, they allowed me to either go through long-term treatment, like three years of treatment, or I could do my, which I would only probably serve like two years, right? So I, I wanted to get out. Even I was full of myself, like, uh, uh, at that point in time, I'm like, I want to see my kids, yeah. you know? So I'll do whatever I got to do to get out now. But, Put it this way, six months into it, seven, uh, maybe a little longer, seven months, it was 2013, um, seven months after I got into rehab, uh, we were down, I, I just worked on, literally, I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. I would just put 225 on there and do like five sets of like 10 or 15. And I did the same workout every single day. So uh, 225, um, I would do 225 bench press, I would do overhead presses, I'd do curls and I'd do bent over rows just cause stuff we did in football, right? Yeah. So I would do that every single day from Monday. And basically it was like, cause I get to go see my wife today. So I want to look good, right? Yeah. So I get this good pump on, right? Before, cause we would have these events where we got to go counteract. Cause I was locked down 24 hours a day. So I, I basically, I started working out because it helped with my depression 
and it made me feel like I was like getting my swole on, right? So um, one day we were down in the basement just hanging out because where, where I went to rehab at was a, it was a, a crisis in recovery, but it was like in a hundred year old home. A hundred year old home had a dirt floor as a, ba as a, ba uh, the, the, the dirt floor was in the basement anyway. How you put it? But uh, um, I remember we, we, uh, we had been working out and it was like, man, I bet you could lift every single weight down here. And, uh, you know, I got to looking around. And, you know, I'm cocky a little bit at the time. I'm feeling myself. And I was like, throw the weight on there. Let's see. And uh, we threw all the weight on there in the basement. And it, it, uh, I did it for three reps. Well, we added the weight up afterwards. I know. Smart. And it ended up being 505 pounds. And it was like, I, I just rep 505 pounds? And they're like, yeah, you rep 505 pounds. You know how big of a deal that is? And I'm like. I've always been somewhat strong and fast, uh, like, uh, you know, I was an athlete. But even whenever I did that 505 for three reps, I didn't realize how strong I was. I was, at that time, I was probably about 290 pounds. And uh, I still didn't realize how strong I was until uh, one of the guys was telling one of the counselors there, like, do you know that Julius just benched 505 for three reps and he just stopped? He didn't even, he probably had more in the tank. And uh, he was like, he called me in the office. He was like, you realize, like, not many people are doing this. You have no structured program. You've been working out in a basement with seven foot ceilings. Like, you know, let's see what you can do. So I was going, they would let me go to the YMCA where I would go to the YMCA on my passes and I'd work out in that basement. Um, and it's all about how bad I wanted it, you know? And I've never, so like, I remember there was a point in time where whenever I tried to achieve goals in life, it just didn't happen because I always compromised myself. I always found a way to get it. I was good at that. I was always good at finding a way to get in trouble. Right. So for me, see, proving to myself that I could achieve goals, my first competition, I hit 525. Then six months later, um, really started trying to focus on, you know, doing all I, all I did was five by fives, like twice a week. And they started doing whatever um, I, stuff I seen on the Internet. And I did a meet like six, seven months later, and I put up 620. And then somebody reached out to Josh Bryant because I had no clue what I was doing. Like I said, my foot placement was all over the place. But once I hit 620 at that meet, it's kind of, I started to look, realize like, hey, I'm 100 pounds off of the world record at this point in time. It was Eric Spoto at 722. And I was like, man, maybe, maybe I, could, I, could, I could give this a shot. And uh, the counselor that was there, that I, he was end up being my workout partner, he reached out to Josh Bryant and told Josh Bryant, and I remember early on when Josh Bryant would be like, you realize that you, once we start programming, you're getting you right, you're gonna break the world record. And I remember laughing. He would, we would go back and forth in emails, right? And I'm like, man, this dude's nuts. And I had to make a, 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 I had to make a point to myself because once I seen the programming, what programming looked like, I was like, I don't. There, there'd be days I'd be rethinking life just in general. It was so much volume and stuff that I just wasn't. You, my body wasn't acclimated to doing those type of things. But uh, that was that point. But the real point for me, what really was set in stone was whenever Correll broke the record at 7.30.38. He broke that record, I had to make my mind up. Is that a pivotal moment for me? Like, do I wanna keep going or do, because at that time I had, um, I just graduated rehab. Uh, my wife's sister had to give her baby up. So we had to take him in. I just, I, I've never done manly stuff in life. I always ran from my responsibilities, never paid my bills, always neglected everything around me. So at that point in time, it's like, I'm just learning, learning how to be a man at the age of 26. So we had our nephew, um, he was six months old. Then we had my daughter, uh, found out my wife was pregnant. And uh, like I went from having zero responsibility to every responsibility. And then boom, it was like a gut punch when I seen Corell break that record. And even though it was only 20, 20 more pounds, 18 more pounds, it was like, man, I have to kick it into another gear. Like how do you keep out beating yourself? But that was the point when I was like, okay, I'm getting serious whenever Corell broke that record. And, 620, I was uh, 620, I was 340 pounds. Then by the end, by, by the time I graduated rehab, I went from 320 to 420. So I gained 100 pounds in another, what, seven months, eight months. And then uh, I've been fluctuating from, well, I haven't been 320 in I don't know how long. The high, heaviest I've been uh, was uh, at that meet in uh, South Bend and I was 464. But I was miserable. I was lethargic. I couldn't breathe. Like I was just. Peanut butter. 
Right. What are you right now? These dudes. Uh, three thirty-five. <laughs> So, um, I'm, and, wait, wait, I mean, no, 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 I'm sorry, 4, 435, 435. So, uh, but like Louis said, like, due to conditioning and, and understanding different training approaches, it's like, I'm confident that whoever I go up against in the gym, I'm, I'm going to work circles around them. Asshole, so bring her here. We gonna, we're going we're gonna to tear some stuff up. And I'm gonna keep up with the best. So if you don't have that mindset when you come to the gym, you might as not, you might as well not even step through that door. If your mindset coming into the gym is like going through the motions, because I was going through the motions many times, I was doing my programming just to tell Josh, yeah, I completed my programming. But I wasn't doing the programming to build that block, because every program day is a building block for you to get closer to your ultimate goal. And at that point, it came realization to me that I better start taking this a little more serious than I did. So every time. I came through that gym door, hey, it's game time. And that's why when you see me working out, I don't surround myself, but besides this dude right here, I don't surround myself with dudes that can't that I ain't lifting no weight. I mean, <laughs> his bench is about 350 or something like that. But, that's a lie. Oh, um, so with that being said, like Louis <laughs> said, like if you don't want to come put in the work, like guys, those of you who who either you or yourself don't want to come in the gym and put in that work, or you want to put in the work and the people around you they're wish washy then you got to cut those people out of your life. That's not only in the gym, but that's outside, at home, the work environment. Although if they're not excelling or trying to better you, um, that's a part of me is why I excel is because I cut all those people out of my life that don't want to uh, attain greatness. So if you're not searching for greatness, striving to empower other people, those around you, and, and basically inspire the world, like West Side Barbell, you, you see people from all around the world wearing West Side T-shirts, and I mean, that's that's the legacy that I want to leave behind. Is that it? Because I'm, I'm sure Lou's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Joe. I just, I just want to say one thing. Uh, in the last what, six eight months, I had to, I asked three all time world records to leave my gym. You, sometimes you got to do that. If you're not with the program, you got to get them out of there. And that's just the way it is. Sounds good. You know, my gym's private. I pay for everything. They don't pay for nothing. Their job is to come here and make my gym more famous. The guys always come and say, Louie, I think you could really help me. I said, well, what can you do for Westside? If you can't get on my board, I don't need your ass, you know. It ain't about me. It's about Westside Barbell. I guess we're one of the same, but still, it's got you got to help Westside or I don't need you. Straight up. Any more questions, guys? I have a question for Louie. Go ahead. When would you chains over bands and would you ever mix the two resistances or no? We use them both sometimes, but we mostly use bands. Okay. Yeah, a lot of bands. A lot of bands. For just over speed of centric effect, that's why. Yeah. If it's too much for you, then you gotta use chains, because there's no over speed of centric with the chain. Yeah. That's it. Like he says he uses I know that. I've seen a lot of guys get hurt using a lot of bands. I mean we're we're <laughs> used to it. Yeah. Like most bands we use for speed is two hundred pound a band, but these are strong ass guys. But you want to make sure you build up, you, you establish well, a base, absolutely. Yeah. and then you just build up slowly. Percent. Yeah, percentage. Don't go past 33% of your bench with the bands. Whatever that is, but you, you're going to get in trouble. And also, then you got to, you got to load up, unload too much weight in the bottom. So you want to make sure. We do a lot of stuff wrong, too. I mean, all the way down, yeah. you know, real weight. You got to do it all. Okay? Um, I'm a swim coach in the area, and Louie, I know you mentioned meditation. Um, that's something I use my team nowadays can you have any and like my guys are swimming great I've seen them kind of come in you know ready to work a little bit harder and take the time to really focus on the competitions do you have anything to elaborate Julius as you as well about like the mental toughness side of things I, I, that's showing up they should be the book of the five rings they should lead Jonathan Livingston Seagull they got to get out of mind you have to have an out of mind experience so you'll never do anything and uh, yeah that's uh, mentally that's about it and relax, learn to relax. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, I mean, I just pose the same question to everybody is, what do you want to be remembered at? You know, uh, the, the, the main thing that what keeps me going also is thinking like, whenever I, whenever I get Louis' age, hopefully I get that age at one point, uh, do I want to look back and say, man, thank God I made those sacrifices to, from where I'm at today? Or um, am I going to be one of them guys that just reminisces on times in high school? Oh, back in high school, I benched 435 back in high school. I don't want to be one of those guys. And I'm sorry if there's a, I'm not sorry. If there's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, know, 
You know, because uh, like, you got to think about the legacy you're going to leave behind. So, and what, what, I, what I've told people, because I talk to students all the time, is I'm like, if you don't try now, later on when this when this opportunity passes by, you're going to look back one day and wish you had that chance again. Okay. Don't be the, the one of those guys that 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 wishes that they gave optimal effort. Like my guy here, dude blew both blew both of his knees out, broke his ankle, and he's talking about, look, I'm in the gym already. I'm already doing good mornings. I'm ready to get back to the grind. So. I mean, it's just that drive, and you have to, every day is a new day to keep finding that drive. It's a fight, but the fight is worth fighting, right? So you have to fight every single day. You have to fight to get up and go to work. You have to fight to love your wife. You have to fight to love your kids. You have to fight for what you want in life. And once you start surrendering and buckling down to the pressures of the world, your life is going to start going downhill. It's going to be like, like this, right? So I don't want to be that guy. Thank God you're not. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, guys, we're going to wrap it up. We appreciate you guys coming out. It's yeah, definitely thanks. been an honor. Hey, you too, man. Beside you. I yeah. appreciate you.